Uh, welcome to the breakout session on energy, climate, and the environment. My name is Nancy Freitas, and I am your host for the evening. Um, I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and I'm currently studying how climate change affects the Arctic. I'm looking at how permafrost is thawing and trying to figure out how much of it might thaw in the future. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. We're seeing shifting weather patterns that are affecting food production, and we're seeing catastrophic natural disasters, both of which are global and unprecedented changes. Light the Way is going to enable our faculty and our students to understand the depths of environmental change. It's going to help us speed up strategies for mitigating and adapting to, to climate change, some of which we're going to hear about tonight, and ensure that vulnerable populations can participate positioning to clean energy and other needs. So tonight I am pleased to introduce two faculty leaders in this field, Solomon Shung, the Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy, and Wendy Silver, the Rudy Gras Chair and Professor of Ecosystem Ecology and Biogeochemistry. Each is going to speak to us for about three minutes um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So over the next three minutes, please um, drop your questions into the chat box and uh, we will get back to you. So we're gonna kick it off with Solomon. I'm Solomon Shung and I direct the Global Policy Lab here at Berkeley. Uh, I grew up as a kid who loved math and science, but I remember looking around and realizing that something wasn't quite right in the world. There were kids out there, other kids that didn't have the same happy-go-lucky childhood I had. And the more I learned, I, I really began to appreciate that there were billions of people around the world working as hard as they can to improve the condition of their families. But all of that activity has tremendous impact on the global environment. And so we are now today in a situation where we're trying to, on the one hand, maximize global human potential, but at the same time, we're trying to care for the planet. So, you know, we often think about technological revolutions and people will imagine, they'll think about electricity, light bulbs, the internet, self-driving cars. I like to point out that many of the technological revolutions that have had the greatest impact actually have to do with how we govern ourselves, the technologies of how we design policy. So whether it was, you know, a long time ago, realizing we should write down laws or that individuals should be treated equally, that everyone should have the right to vote. These types of changes have affected people's well-being around the world for generations. And we are right now in the midst of another very exciting technological revolution where the use of computing and data are allowing us for the first time to understand and really see how actions in one part of the world can impact people everywhere, or they can actually affect people down many generations into the future. And so my group here at Berkeley, we spend our time doing research, trying to understand the benefits to the world of transitioning our global energy supply. We study how we can adapt. Should we be engineering, geoengineering the atmosphere? Should we redesign the treaties that govern how uh, oceans are used? what can be done about global agriculture, transboundary air pollution. And the results of our work are for the public. We spend a lot of time getting out there, talking to the media, reaching out to decision makers, traveling to DC or Geneva to talk to people about the future. We even spend time talking to the private sector, folks at Nike or BlackRock, because they too wanna help nudge the world uh, on the right track. And so here at Berkeley, the work we're doing is really lighting the path forward, uh, helping everyone see the different ways we might proceed so we can understand the choices ahead. You know, in the past, leaders had to like look at the stars or ask a fortune teller what might happen as a result of their actions. But now we're able to use data and science to help everybody really understand the global consequence of our, consequences of our actions so that we can work together to decide and then move forward, building a world for our children. That's what we want. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Wendy Silver. I'm an ecosystem ecologist and a biogeochemist. And we study climate change. And all of you know that climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing our society today. We know that greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, and we know why. 
And we also know that to solve the climate change crisis, we have to reduce emissions. That's essential. But unfortunately, emissions reduction is no longer sufficient in and of itself to solve the climate change problem. In addition to emissions reduction, we need to actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And when we do both emissions reduction and carbon dioxide removal, we have the seeds of a solution to climate change. Now, I became interested in finding solutions to climate change when it became clear that we needed to use everything that we had, including our natural and managed ecosystems to tackle this big problem. I think it's easy to become paralyzed by the sheer scale and complexity of a problem like climate change. And I think this is why the majority of the research thus far has focused on making incremental improvements on describing the sources of greenhouse gas emissions and the role of human activity, as opposed to really diving deep on various solutions. We decided to see if we could use the vast areas of natural and working lands to help pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one exciting project we've been involved with is repurposing high emitting greenhouse gas, high greenhouse gas emitting waste streams like food waste that goes to landfills or livestock waste that's stored in piles and slurry ponds and putting those into lower emitting composting systems and then using that compost as an organic fertilizer, again, in place of uh, higher emitting chemical fertilizers. And the results are pretty exciting. Uh, the first that was really surprising to me is that people just seem to love compost. Everybody seems to really like compost. And we've shown that compost amendments can increase plant growth, which is good for farmers and ranchers, but it's also good for the rest of us because the plants, as they grow, pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And some of that new carbon gets injected into the soil through the roots and provides a natural form of carbon dioxide removal. Uh, increasing the carbon in soils via Greater organic matter content also increases the water holding capacity, which helps protect us from droughts, and it decreases erosion. And of course, it provides nutrients, which help the plants grow, and then ultimately feeds people. Um, our research is showing that this is scalable. Uh, there's a lot of really exciting um, work with adoption and getting farmers and ranchers interested in this. And in the true Berkeley tradition of collaboration, we're working with uh, engineers and data scientists on campus to develop new and inexpensive sensors that will allow farmers and ranchers to see their emissions in real time with a cell phone. And that could dramatically increase adoption of carbon farming practices and lead to uh, even more climate change mitigation. So that's just a quick example of how we're lighting the way to a healthier, cleaner, and low carbon future. Thanks. Great. Thank you both Wendy and Saul for catching us up on what you're doing um, and talking about what you're looking at moving into the future. Um, we have some questions rolling in right now. Um, so we're going to start with the first one, which is what is one thing that we can do as individuals to reduce our climate warming impact? Oh, uh, uh, the thing I would say, particularly right now, is I would say wherever you are, if, and if you can, vote. Um, that's probably the best thing that you can do to have an impact is, is, is vote for people or support programs that help us um, use renewable energy sources that help lower our carbon footprint um, and that really focus on uh, ways in which our society can move forward. Our society as a whole, our global society, can move forward in ways that uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions, pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and um, improve general well-being of, of our populations. Definitely. It's a very timely response as well. <laughs> Saul, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I just, you know, uh, in addition to voting and working towards policies, I know many of us want to make little changes to our life. So things like eating less meat, even if you don't go full vegetarian, you know, just meat is one of these things that consumes a tremendous amount of resources and ends up releasing a lot of greenhouse gases. Those little things are just biking more, driving less, anything you can do that changes, chips away at what happens every day on a daily basis in your life, that stuff adds up over time and leads to having a very large impact, even though each little action is itself quite small. Yeah, so those small actions are really important and they couple really well with those large like governance actions. 
Um, so the second question that just came in is, uh, what is being done to use wave energy to tackle um, the need to harness the ocean's energy? I don't know which one of you would prefer to take that one. I'll say that wave energy is in essence, it's actually a form of wind energy. So all the waves on the ocean are just the wind blowing waves across the ocean. And so there is a, some research moving forward on wave energy, but at the end of the day, uh, wind energy and solar energy are really the leading renewables that are showing the most promise in terms of having a huge amount of potential and being able to deliver power at very low cost. So both solar and wind are really leading uh, in many parts of the world today. And there's other expansions of other fuel types, but um, wave energy is, has some promise, but it's... it's um, it's just a difficult environment. Engineering in the ocean is hard. Salt water is really cor corrosive and it makes replacing the infrastructure at a regular basis quite expensive. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, Wendy, we've got a question for you. Uh, with respect to converting animal and other waste to compost, are you addressing issues of contamination and chemicals in that waste, which can cause additional pollution if applied to fields? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we've been very concerned about. So we're collaborating with microbiologists also here at Berkeley and up at the Berkeley lab to um, look at the potential of composting to break down pharmaceuticals and to break down antibiotics. And the short answer is, is it looks very promising. We're seeing that the, the material come out very clean. The one area where uh, we have the the, probably the biggest problem is with heavy metals. So if we put organic material that have that has heavy metals in it, th there's really no way for us to remove that during the composting process. So that's going to be a feedstock issue and making sure that people sort their waste carefully. Um, if we can keep heavy metals out of the organic waste stream in general, that would be good for everybody. Um, but uh, it may, may not be possible to do all of it. But um, in general, most of the pollutants and uh, pharmaceuticals do break down during the composting process. And it's in California, at least in the state of California, it's all regulated and every uh, compost pile before it can be sold has to be, has to be checked. So it goes through a lab and gets certified before it can be sold. And that's really the state of the art. Hopefully, hopefully that will begin to be adopted elsewhere as well. Great. Thank you. Um, Saul, we have a question for you. Um, you were talking about the intersection between technology and governance. And this question is, uh, what are the most promising technologies that might help us solve the climate change problem? I mean, I gotta say that where we get energy, there's, there's, so batteries are transforming so many systems today because what batteries allow us to do is they let us use renewable energy sources in many cases where we needed energy to be very transportable, you know? So for a long time, it was hard to get cars to be electric because we couldn't get them off the grid. So, you know, gasoline, hydrocarbons were the only energy system that had an energy density high enough that we could move things around. So by switching to batteries in a lot of cases, it's letting us electrify everything. Now, in some cases, it's really hard to use batteries. So airplanes, for example, Batteries are very heavy. And so in those cases, switching to things like hydrogen fuels have the potential to provide the same energy density you need while also being transportable. And so I think you know these transitions away from hydrocarbons are really gonna be the key. That's really the only path forward for a sustainable future in which everyone has a very high standard of living and countries around the world can develop um, at the same time without sort of hindering future generations. I think there's a follow up to this, which might be our last question um, for this session, which is uh, which source of energy, wind or solar, shows more promise um, and which is most likely to overcome political obstacles? Oh, I mean, they're both actually making a lot of headway, but it depends on where you are. Just like, you know, hydrocarbons aren't everywhere in the world. It depends on geography. The same is true with wind and sun. So, you know, in some parts of the world, there's a huge amount of solar energy available. In other places, it's cloudy, but the winds blow pretty steadily. So depending on 
you know, where you are determines what's most profitable for your local community. But I think people are seeing, they, they like it. It's a lot nicer to have some solar panels, you know, on your roof rather than breathing in air pollution from the local, you know, coal plant. So it's not a bad lifestyle. And I think it's going to be better for everyone.